My name is Louis Hill. Uh, I think most of you will know about my father, James J. Hill. Uh, he made quite a splash in this town a few years back. Uh, <coughs> as you know, he was a uh, he was a railroad man, and he built a railroad all the way from here to the Pacific Ocean. We'll tell you about that as we go along. Um, he passed away a couple of decades ago, and this year, 1938, marks the 100th anniversary of his birth. Now, I mentioned the Great Northern Railroad. I'm now proud to be the president of that railroad. And I've been asked to come and talk to you this evening about some antitrust nonsense that, that <laughs> troubled us back in uh, uh, around the turn of the century, around 1903. A case called the Northern Securities Case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And uh, those of you who are lawyers in the audience probably know something about that. Uh, you see, when Theodore Roosevelt became president, can you believe that some people actually call him Teddy? <laughs> what, what kind of a name is that for a grown man, for Pete's sake? I mean, if you're gonna make up a name, make up a good one. You take my father, for instance. Uh, he was born just plain old James Hill. When he was about 13 years old, he decided he needed to differentiate himself from his father, who was also known as James Hill. So he, uh, he thought about it and decided he would take a middle name. And uh, <clears throat> after a considerable thought, he decided he would take the name of Napoleon Bonaparte's brother, Jerome. My father always was modest like that. <laughs> well, in fact, you should know something about my father's background in order to better understand the Northern Securities case. So here it is, the story of my father, James Jerome Hill, the empire builder of the Northwest. Now I think that every story is better with pictures. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, you know. <coughs> uh, up there in the booth, can you, uh, can you get the slideshow started, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Hill. I'll tell you, this, this modern technology is really something. I mean, uh, the folks up there uh, were able to take the uh, photographs and clippings and uh, drawings that came from our family album and turn them into slides so you folks can see them right up here. Now this first one that you see is a, uh, a slide of a, a, a picture from a Canadian newspaper. You know, I assume, that my father was born in Canada. He was a hardworking immigrant, just like so many of the people that he brought here to populate the great Northwest. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we'll get back to that. Father came from sturdy Scots-Irish stock. His father's parents settled in Canada, uh, got together with, with uh, an uncle who had gotten a land grant because he'd fought in the Napoleonic Wars. Grandfather met and married a woman named Ann Dunbar, and the two of them settled on a hard scrabble 50-acre farm about 60 miles from Toronto. My father was born in a log cabin very much like that one that you see uh, uh, there on the slide. It was built by my grandfather. He did all the work. He felled the trees, he even split the shingles for the roof. Well, uh, as you might imagine, it was a hard life. They weren't very prosperous. As a matter of fact, speaking of that roof, Father used to tell us that sometimes he would lie awake at night looking up at the moon <laughs> through the holes in the roof. Well, as I say, they were, they were poor, but they had books. They had Shakespeare. They had Robert Burns, a dictionary, the Bible, of course, and they had a book about the life of Napoleon Bonaparte. My father really enjoyed that book. He was especially fond of that. But like any country boy, a father all 
also spent as much time as possible fishing and hunting, and he spent a lot of time fishing with his brother Alex. Those two were inseparable. up there. He, he would show them the rustic life. He even took President Cleveland up there one time. <laughs> but the big fella got stuck in a canoe. <laughs> I went, well, well I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's see, where, where was I here? Yes. Yes, about 1848, grandfather gave up the farm and moved the family into town, small town called Rockford, uh, Rockwood, excuse me, where he tried his hand at business. He bought a roadside tavern. Suddenly, father found himself in what might kindly be described as a, uh, a raucous environment. He said he saw enough misery in that place to cure him of ever wanting to drink or gamble. My father's life changed dramatically one Christmas day when his father died after a brief illness. Father was only about 14 then, but suddenly he was the man of the family. So he went out and got a job. He got a job as a store clerk where his duties included uh, double entry bookkeeping <laughs> and milking cows and cutting wood. He was sorry to have to quit school. He, he, he liked school, but he did want to keep up with his studies. So he studied at night and on Sundays. When he was about 17, two of his classmates dropped in and they filled his head with stories about the success of the adventures with the Hudson's uh, Bay Company's Red River Brigade. 
Uncle Alex was old enough to care for grandmother, so father thought that that sounded like a pretty good idea, and he, he set off to explore the land of opportunity. Since the brigade headquarters were at the edge of the wilderness on the Mississippi River, father took an ocean to see St. Paul. I hope this letter finds you all doing well. I am fine and healthy. I arrived in St. Paul by a packet boat a few weeks ago, but the brigade had already left. I secured an important position with a steamboat company. My honorable title is Mud Clerk. <laughs> because I load and unload cargo on the muddy levee. I also do some book work. My salary is twice as much as I could get back home, and the work is comparatively easy. A best of all, duties end at 6 p.m. every evening, so I am free to walk around and explore the town. I have many friends, including a pair of tame otters. They follow me around like puppies, and even fetch sticks thrown into the water. Since hotels are in short supply, I'm sharing a room with four other young fellows who like to stay up half the night, sometimes all the night. But not to worry, Mother, I never drink no liquor nor gamble. I've got a job for the winter guarding a steamboat tied up at the levee in exchange for a free berth. I will bring plenty of books and I'm looking forward to reading Gibbon's Rome. I, I plan to simply work as hard as I can and keep up with my studies so I will be ready to embrace the next opportunity that comes along. Your loving son, James Jerome Hill. <laughs> became a legend along the levee. Everybody knew him as Jim Hill, the name usually rendered as if it were one word. Old timers have told me that Jim Hill worked 24 hours a day and 25 on Sunday. He tried to join a Minnesota regiment to fight in the Civil War, but he was rejected because he had sight in only one eye. When he was nine years old, he was helping his brother Alex to fashion a bow and arrow, and somehow the bow broke and the arrow snapped back and it, it took his eye right out. Well, the, the country doctor was able to replace it, put it back in the socket, but he could never see out of that eye after that. It didn't stop him, though, from serving in the Pioneer Guard and the fire department. There, there's a, a good photo of the old Pioneer Guard. Even though he had only one eye, father was a great shot with a rifle. I bet we could have won the Civil War in about two months if they'd, if they'd let father join up. He saw an opportunity, <clears throat> it was about 1862, when he saw an opportunity to expand his shipping business when the first railroad came through uh, from St. Paul to Minneapolis. He saw this opportunity as a way to get into the freight transfer business, advertising the lowest rates ever quoted from St. Paul to Eastern Points. He came up with ways to keep his rates low, like, like this warehouse here. He, he was the first one to build a warehouse right on the levee so he could transfer freight from the, from the steamboats right onto the trains and he had the trains running right through the warehouse so he could transfer freight in any weather. He was in on the first shipments of Minnesota flour east. Back then, nobody had ever heard of Minnesota flour, so they stamped the, the bags with an Ohio brand. <laughs> <laughs> turned, out, turned out that it was more popular than the genuine Ohio flour. Well, he came to know every mile of the Red River Valley. He traveled the wilderness from here to Fort Garry, what, what we now call Winnipeg. 
in order to establish trading connections for his steamboat. When winter came, he would allow neither snow nor bitter cold to delay his exploration. He, he traveled by dog sled and scouted out the territory. Of course, when the ice broke up, the busy shipping season started up again in St. Paul. Like so many men in those days, Father often took his meals at the Merchant's Hotel, which was located uh, about a block from the steamboat landing. Now, I don't know whether the food was really any good there, but there was a young waitress working there named Mary Mahegan. She was as sensible and modest and wholesome as she was pretty. And uh, that may have had something to do with the popularity of I like it very much. I thought so, since you've ordered it every day for the past few weeks. <laughs> Mr. Hegan? Yes, Mr. Hill? You have very refined skills of deduction. How so? Well, you say that you noticed that I order stew every day, and from that, you were able to determine that I like stew, correct? Yes. Well, Miss Mehegan, what if you were to know that every day I asked to have my stew brought to my table by you, oh. what would you deduce from that? Mr. Hill, I guess I'd have to give that some thoughts. Please, <laughs> give it some very serious thoughts. I will. Mary held the respectful admiration of all the young fellows who came to the Merchant's Hotel but to their consternation, one day she just up and disappeared. They all thought that Jim Hill had had something to do with that. Miss Mahegan, this war between North and South can't last forever. When the Union is secure, people will head out west to tame the frontier. My modest success in the shipping business is a perfect place in which to build an empire. Oh, Mr. Hill, I know you have made a name for yourself these past eight years in St. Paul, and now you plan to be an empire builder? <laughs> an empire builder? I like the sound of that one. Oh, yes, but every empire builder needs a partner. Oh? Yes, I have a position available for someone with intelligence, charm, and beauty to impress important men and their wives. I believe you, Miss Mahegan, are the right woman for the job. I propose a merger. Oh, is this a marriage proposal? Yes, Miss Mahegan. May I call you Mary? If you will have me. A swan. I believe that we would be a great team. But, Mr. Hill, I am Catholic and you are not. Ah, yes. I have spoken to your priest, Father Calais, and I have informed him, though I have no intentions of converting to Catholicism myself, that I will support you and any children in which we are blessed in your celebration of the Catholic faith. But I am only 17 years old and just a simple waitress. How could I ever be the wife of an empire builder? Oh. Yes, I have thought on that subject, and I have secured the funds to send you to St. Mary's Institute in Milwaukee. But I already graduated from St. Joseph's here in St. Paul. I was a very good pupil. You can ask Ellen Ireland. She's a good friend of mine. Who is Ellen Ireland? You know her brother, John Ireland. He's chaplain with Minnesota's 5th Regiment. Ah, uh, yes, I have heard of him. He might make something of himself in this town. <laughs> He survives the war. But back to the matter at hand, I have no doubt that your Catholic schooling is quite sufficient, my dear, but I want something more for you. I want to send you to one of the finest finishing schools in the Midwest. And what would I do there? Well, you would study etiquette. You would learn art appreciation, music, sewing, and of course, French. Land sakes. Upon completion of your studies, you'll be properly 
that you are properly equipped to impress the wealthiest and most important men and, of course, their wives. But Milwaukee is so far away from home. Yes, but I would come and visit from time to time to continue our courtship. I know Father Clay approves of you, or he would never have allowed us to walk out together. He did mention that he thinks you're an up-and-coming young man. Yes, he approves. Well, it sounds as if you men have it all worked out. Is this merger plan subject to my approval? Yes, Miss Mahegan. Subject to your approval. Then you may call me Mary. Three years later, in 1867, they were married in the rectory of the bishop's home. Father's first major merger was an incredible success. <laughs> Firstborn was my sister Mary, named after my mother, of course. Second was my older brother James. I was the third. My parents' merger went on to produce Catherine, Ruth, Clara, Charlotte, Rachel, Gertrude, and Walter. By 1874, Father had been in St. Paul for about 18 years. He had a growing family and was simultaneously in the steamboat business, the fuel business, the general transportation business. He was a member of the boards of several important leading banks, yet he still found time to grab any attractive business opportunity that came his way. He got into coal and he became something of an expert in railroad rolling stock. He bought a bankrupt iron foundry and sold off the scrap metal. He bought a saloon. He even got into dealership in apple cider when he thought that would be profitable. <laughs> well, Father thought a lot about the settlers in the Red River Valley. When there was no, with no railroad, they had to wait for the ice to melt on the Red River so they could travel by boat in order to reach their new homesteads. He knew a rail line would save them an entire year because they could arrive in time to plant a cash crop and harvest it in that same first year. Father studied the local railroads in great detail. And when the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad went bankrupt, he saw a great opportunity. You see, the state of Minnesota had given the SP&P, as it was known, a generous land grant if the railroad could complete the line to the Canadian border. Well, for two years, Father gathered information on SP&P's legal, financial, and legislative tangle. He lived it, ate with it, slept with it, dreamed of it. Finally, he calculated it would take several million dollars to buy it. He certainly didn't have that kind of money, but through his business connections, he knew some people who did. Norman Kitson, how are you? Well, this is my old friend Jim Hill. What have you been up to these days? Uh, Norman, I have been meaning to talk to you about a terrific opportunity. The SP&P is now in receivership. Well, if we can get our hands on that railroad, the land grants alone are worth $19.4 million. Yeah, a prodigious sum indeed, but uh, how much are they asking for it? Only $5.6 million. Oh, that's an awful lot to risk on an old railroad. Why? I hear that line is nothing more than two streaks of rust in a right of way. Norman! Oh, the SP&P is a gold mine. Why, with the right man in charge, operating efficiency could be increased, and the, the net earnings could be as much as $600,000 to $800,000 per year. And I suppose uh, you are the right man to be in charge? Well, I do know a thing or two about the shipping business. Yeah, um, well, I might be interested. You know, I could tell my friend, uh, Donald Smith, about it. He might be able to invest. He knows George Steffen at the Bank of uh, Montreal up in Canada. You know, if we got a banker in on the deal, they're bound to know some potential investors. By come, this is a wild idea, but it just might work. 
In 1877, this group of investors finally gained control of the railroad. But in order to keep the land grants, the, the race was on to complete the main line from Crookston to the Canadian border by the 31st of December, 1878. Father personally saw to every aspect of construction down to the smallest details. Now, here we see men grading the roadbed in order to get the best right of way with the lowest grade and the fewest curves. Father personally went out in his buckboard to look, scout out the routes. Here are some workers laying the rails. Father had them laying rails at the unheard of rate of two miles a day. He even was known to pick up a sledgehammer himself and uh, join the gandy dancers in driving in the spikes. He seemed to be everywhere at once. He worked the men practically around the clock to complete the railroad before the deadline, and actually, he finished a month ahead of time. In 1879, they renamed the road the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba Railway Company with father as the general manager. He knew for the line to be a success, he needed farmers to settle on the land, uh, uh, the land grants along the railroad right of way, so he built great grain elevators and depots close to the railroad all along the way. He said, land without population is a wilderness. And population without land is a mob. <laughs> well, Father then went on, to camp, uh, went on a campaign to recruit farmers, and he dispatched special immigration agents to Europe. Well, howdy, folks. I understand you're interested in coming to America. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's like it's hard here in Norway. <laughs> well, let me tell you, sir, Mr. Jim Hill has farmland all along his new railroad. Some can be bought for as little as $2.50 an acre American. Well, that's just a few kroner. That sounds good. <laughs> what do you think, Mama? But Papa, what about church? We cannot live like heathens. Oh, not to worry, ma'am. Jim Hill is donating the land for churches, for parks, and schools. There be schools? schools. Did you hear that, Barna? There be schools. <laughs> Hardworking farmers just like you to toil that soil. But crops should be planted. You can plant wherever you want, but wheat does especially well. <laughs> and how do we sell these crops? Well, Jim Hill believes that the farmers and the railroads are a community of interest. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> the railroad and the farmers depend on each other for success. You can store your grain in Jim Hill's elevators and he will ship it at the lowest possible rate. You can't go wrong investing in the Nile of the North. <laughs> so, how many acres can I sign you up for, huh? This Jim Hill sounds like a good man. I think we should go. What do you say, Mama? Sure thing, Papa. The winters can't be any worse than they are here in Norway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with this kind of promotion, it wasn't long before immigrants poured in from Sweden, Norway, Ireland, Germany, to settle in the new towns that sprang up like mushrooms along the rich land along the railway. Ever seeking to improve service, Father began to work on what some called Hill's Folly, the Great Stone Arch Bridge. It still stands today. I'm sure you've, you've heard of it or seen it. There it is, a beautiful curved granite bridge near the falls of St. Anthony in Minneapolis. It was Father's pride and joy. Most important to him, thanks to the Stone Arch Bridge, it took only 20 minutes to travel from St. Paul to Minneapolis. The papers called it one of the greatest specimens of engineering skill in the whole country. But you know, Father had much bigger plans. He knew that in order to control his fate, 
and the shipping rates. He needed a transcontinental system. So in order to extend the railroad to Montana, he first had to get Congress to give him the right of way over Indian lands. It took a couple of tries, but finally President Cleveland said, well, the Indians had way more land than they could use anyway. <laughs> so he signed a bill clearing the way for construction. By the summer of 1887, Father had assembled an army and set to work. It was an enormous undertaking. He built special three-decker dormitory cars, you can see here. They were used to house this army of men on the move building the railroad. Father decided to call the venture the Great Northern Railway. He liked the grand sound of that name. You know, Father was in his 50s, but he wasn't slowing down. He was involved in every detail of what he called his great adventure. All right, Miss Perkins, we're gonna need enough of those dormitory cars to house 8,000 men. And if we don't have enough, we will build more. Yes, Mr. Hill. We'll need 6,600 horses hitched in yokes of two for the grading crews. That'll mean 600,000 bushels of oats to feed them. Get that ordered right away. Yes, Mr. Hill. I want every available locomotive and every piece of rolling stock we have sent to Minot. We'll need three million ties, enough lumber for trestles, and good quality steel rails. Yes, sir, Mr. Hill. <laughs> uh, sir. One of the foremen has questioned the need to raise the roadbed. Well, Miss Perkins, you can tell that greenhorn that we will scallop the roadbed no less than two nor more than three feet above the prairie floor. That way, the prevailing winds help to remove the snow from the tracks. Oh, you have to understand that railroading is an involved, cumbersome, chaotic affair. I intend to make it a science. <laughs> With my methods, I intend to have us have the railroad that runs better, more, more efficiently, and more expeditiously than any other railroad in the country. <laughs> this all sounds so exciting. <laughs> I hear the Rocky Mountain scenery is just thrilling. Rocky Mountain scenery. <laughs> we don't care enough about Rocky Mountain scenery to invest a good deal of money in developing it. No, 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 no. What we want are the straightest routes, least curvature, and lowest grades for the hauling of goods. <laughs> but what about passenger service? Passenger service. <laughs> Passenger service is like the male teat, neither functional nor particularly pretty. <laughs> now I want my private A1 car provisioned and ready to roll first thing in the morning. I don't care if it takes all summer, I'm going to go back and forth along that completed track and show them how it's done. By mid November, they had extended the railroad more than 700 miles, all the way from Minot, North Dakota to Helena, Montana. It took five years and some heroic feats of construction, including a dangerous course over what was called Death Mountain to push that line all the way to the Pacific Ocean. This photo shows a crew driving the last spike connecting the Great Northern Railway. Of course, that was in January of 1893, so we had to wait till June to celebrate here in St. Paul. <laughs> when we did, it was a doozy of a party, let me tell you. There was a grand parade celebrating the great in industries of the Northwest. You can see on that float the line that ran all the way out to the ocean. The Great Northern Railway brought manufactured goods and, and passengers to the newly settled areas of the West, but on the return trips back east, the cars were often empty. Father didn't like that, so he talked to our neighbor, Frederick Weyerhauser, about getting into the Northwest timber business, offering unheard of low rates. You know, Father knew every aspect of railroading. At one time or another, he had held every job on the line. He was baggage man, conductor, engineer, track walker, fireman, passenger agent, freight agent, traffic agent, and everything else. Father had an amazing memory and was able to know the names of every man running a train on the road. He was tough, but fair.
Number 94, that, that means it must be Roberts. Roberts! How's 94 running? Well, you know, we had, we, we had our That's right, you had her in the shop last month, now, didn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. What was the matter? Well, it was the... The, 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 the cylinder, of course it was the cylinder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's it running out? Well, she's, uh, well, she's just... Uh, oh, it's running fine. I'm glad yeah. to hear that, Roberts. Now, you keep up the good work. Have a good day. Thank yes, you. sir. Thank you, sir. What in the... Number 40. Number 40, that means that means you must be Norris. Yeah, I'm Norris. But who the devil are you? Yeah, and how fast were you coming down that hill? Uh, probably 25 miles an hour. Are there, are there no rules on this road regarding the speed of trains? I don't know what business it is of yours, but we're supposed to run 12 miles ordinarily, or, or 24 in an emergency, or if we're carrying cash. Jim Hill was not a man to disappoint, anger, or cross. <laughs> he once fired an employee because he didn't like the man's last name. Spit it. He drove his employees mercilessly, but always with the aim of improving railroad operations in order to provide the lowest possible rates. Passenger service was always secondary even though the Great Northern does pass through some of the most spectacular scenery in the country. Father wasn't interested in, 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 uh, in promoting the line for tourism. Well, you know, Father was the smartest railroad man around and in almost everything I went along with him, but on this one point, I had to disagree. I told him his, that this magnificent scenery was a sight to be seen. Just, just look at it. About 25 years ago, I lobbied Congress to create the Glacier National Park in Montana. You know, it's really something. The majestic Glacier National Park is the symbol of America. If you haven't seen it, you really ought to go. You know, our Great Northern Railway will take you right there, all the way to the park. You can stay in one of our tourist chalets or even our luxurious Glacier Park Hotel. See America first, that's what I say. Well, I, I'm sorry, I, I digress again. I, father wasn't all work and no play. Uh, he, the plain truth is, loved to make money. But he also loved to spend it. I mean, he doted on us children. We had a wonderful childhood with every luxury money could buy. Maybe he felt guilty because he was away so much of the time on business. He had an office in New York and he joined the Metropolitan Club there with his friends, the Rockefellers and the Morgans. Mother was the complete opposite of father. She was the perfect wife for him. He knew it too. Although surrounded by servants, she liked to do her own shopping every day. She would get everything from meats and sweets and wines to the magazines and newspapers that were always found around our houses. Our, our homes, I, I say our homes because eventually we had several. St. Paul, New York, Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. We even had an apartment in Paris. Our summer home, uh, though, was our favorite home, was North Oaks. It was a beautiful 5,000 acre farm, had a great lake for fishing, woodlands for hunting. We just loved it, but it was two hours by carriage from Summit Avenue. <laughs> well, Father wanted more. He decided that we needed a, needed a show place. So he set about planning and building a big, new, beautiful mansion overlooking St. Paul. 
As usual, he oversaw every detail. Mary, come here, you have to see this. What is it now, Papa? I was just counting the linen. I have the floor plans here for the new house. All five floors and the latest in modern plumbing for all 13 bathrooms. 13? Oh, yes, yeah, 13. Papa, we do have a large family, but why ever would we need 13 bathrooms? You must remember the comfort of our servants and the many guests. Oh, of course. Now look over here. This is where we're going to have the two-story art gallery so that all the people can enjoy my collection of fine paintings. All the people? Yeah. I'm not sure about people traipsing through the house and trying oh, to... Oh, no, 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 no. Don't worry, but if you look over there, there's a completely separate public entrance and on the other side, the pipe organ. Oh, I do love organ music. <laughs> oh, only the finest for you, my dear. I've engaged the greatest artisans from Europe to come over to do the crafting on outfitting the entire house in mahogany and oak. Oh, yes, and I have ordered 16 crystal chandeliers. 16? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Did you decide on gas or electricity? Oh, I decided on both. Oh, yes, but it will be the first fully electrified house in the city with its own electrical generator in the basement. <laughs> isn't electric light rather harsh and unflattering? Mary, my dear, you look lovely in any light. <laughs> oh, thank you, Papa. <laughs> well, isn't electricity dangerous? Oh, not to worry, my dear. Besides, I've arranged out all of the fixtures outfitted with both gas jets and electric outlets, just in case there are some difficulties with this newfangled electrical system. Well, it sounds as though you've thought of everything. Uh, Papa, might I be allowed to choose the wallpaper in the dining room? I have always fancied embossed leather as a wall covering. <laughs> Great idea. We shall have the best that money can buy. Well, everybody knows it as the James J. Hill House. There it is. When it was completed in 1891, it was the largest and most expensive home in Minnesota. My sisters had the entire top floor as their playroom, complete with a stage so, so they could entertain themselves and their friends. Favorite family activities were picnics and games on the lawn and formal meals in the evening served in the leather embossed splendor of that dining room. The family lived there for the next 30 years. We gave it to the church when my Ma mother passed. You can drive by, it's up the hill at 240 Summit Avenue. I like that location so much that I built my own house right next door. Both of them are just across the way from the cathedral. Father worked hard to keep the family in luxury. We, we were the lucky ones, not everyone had it so easy. Droughts and falling prices led to the great financial panic of 1893. Banks failed. People who had taken out expensive mortgages lost their brand new homes. Although many railroads failed, Father weathered the crisis with typical efficiency. Because of his firm leadership, the railroad actually made a profit during those tough economic times. Here are those latest expense reports, Mr. Hill. Ms. Perkins, uh, just, just show me the bottom line. Let's see, I think that's on page four. Oh, 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 what, what, oh. Oh, this does look bad. We're going to have to economize if we're going to still be able to weather the financial storm and pay dividends to the shareholders. Yes, Mr. Hill. Take a memo immediately. All expenses are to be cut to the bare minimum. This includes rail, machinery, and stations. Uh, the workforce is to be cut by 19%, and all wages will be reduced. All wages? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Including office staff? All wages. Now we're going to, let's see, we're going to have to cut back on, on, Everything else that we have here. Is that paper boy here yet? Pardon me, ma'am. The time for the papers already? Yes, ma'am. And it looks like there's trouble with the unions. Everybody's been hollering about it. Oh, dear. What's that, oh, dear? Let me see this. Montana. 
Bold Union rebels hijacked a Northern Pacific train. Hijacked? Because it, it's, they, it says here that President Cleveland has sent in federal troops. This is outrageous. They better not do anything like that with my railroad. This is even worse. Eugene Debs, that union organizer, is scheduled to speak in St. Paul tonight. I hear he is quite a dynamic speaker. A dynamic speaker, indeed. Miss <laughs> Perkins, do you hold union sympathies? Oh, no, sir. Of course not, sir. Good, good, good. No, 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 no. Take another memo. Any employee found to be a member of a union will be dismissed immediately without pay. Get that on the wire now. Yes, sir. Union Brothers, my name is Eugene V. Debs, and I do not believe in a social order in which it is possible for one man who has done absolutely nothing that is useful to amass a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars while millions of men and women work all the days of their lives to barely secure a wretched existence. I do not want you to follow me or any man. If you are looking for a Moses to lead you out of this capitalist wilderness, you will stay right where you are. Because no matter if 10,000 times the labor movement shall stumble and fall and be bruised, labor will rise again! No matter if labor is seized by the throat and choked and clubbed into insensibility, enjoined by the courts, traduced by the press, frowned upon by public opinion, deceived by the politicians, infested with spies, deserted by cowards, betrayed by traitors, or sold out by leaders, labor will rise again! Yeah! Labor is the greatest potential power that this planet has ever known, and its historic mission of emancipating the workers of the world is as certain of ultimate realization as is the setting of the sun. <gasps> Thank you! Mr. Hill, can you tell me your opinion of the recent union activity in the Wildcats? And who, may I ask, are you? Ida Tarbell with McClure's Magazine. Our whoa, 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 girl reporter, shouldn't you be at home minding the kitchen? I've never minded a kitchen in my life, Mr. Hill. I was a teacher in Oregon, but now I prefer to write. Oh, a teacher? And what did you teach? Needlepoints and deportments? <laughs> if you must know, I taught four languages. Botany, geometry, trigonometry, and geology. Now... Well, that, that, that is rather impressive for a woman, but you say you'd rather write. What have you written? I'm working on a 20-part series on Abraham Lincoln, and I have another plan on Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon? <laughs> well, well, I suppose I do have a few moments for you, Miss Darbell. Thank you, sir. Now, about the union. Oh, I'll tell you about the union. So they threatened to close down my St. Paul rail yard if I don't give in to their outrageous demands. And what are their demands? Oh, more money for the workers, of course. And, and they're threatening to close me down. Do you think that President Cleveland will send in troops as he did for the Northern Pacific? I wired President Cleveland asking him to send in troops, and he refused. He says sending in troops now could spark another revolution. Huh. And to think, I donated $10,000 to Cle Cleveland's war chest for all the good it has done me. Are you willing to meet with the union representatives? I have nothing to say to the unions. But I, do, I have asked Charles Pillsbury to arbitrate. Are you willing to increase wages if the unions win? Of course not. I can't increase wages. Then I'd have to increase rates dramatically. Do you expect to raise your rates? I would never raise the rates. That would be bad for business. No, 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 no. If necessary, I'll just hire more immigrants as they'll work for less. Uh, you know, more Japanese, oh, more, more Norwegian, Swedes, Poles, and, <clears throat> and even Italians. Oh, I don't care for Italian workers. Why ever not? Oh, all they want to do is work, hoard their money, take it back to Italy, and live in idleness. I see. What about the others? No, well, the Poles are, are, are much more satisfied. 
satisfactory. You know, they're, they're hardy, strong, uh, willing, and, and besides, conditions in Poland are so bad, they want to stay here and settle down. Now, good. Now, west of the Dakotas, I use more jacks than any other nationality because they are by far the most satisfactory workers. Strong, willing, cheerful, and, and, and they'll work for a little less. But most of all, I, impress, I am impressed by their temperance and personal cleanliness. Cleanliness? Oh, yeah, 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 it's cleanliness. Oh, the problem with most of these white workers, and especially those Italians, is they won't keep themselves clean. I mean, the result is illness, typhoid fever running rampant in the camps. You know, much of the time, these workers are incapacitated due to, you know, illness or uh, <clears throat> drunkenness. <laughs> now, 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 I, I do admit that, you know, oftentimes the workers will go along straight for six days, working hard, probably creating more and better work than the same number of men could do anywhere else in the same amount of time in the world. And what's the problem? Oh, I'll tell you what the problem is. On the seventh day, on Sunday, when they should clean up and rest and replenish their energy for another week's work, oh, these white men, <laughs> no, no, they won't clean up. And instead of rest, they make love to the flask. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Hill, is there any truth to the rumor that you issued a memo ordering that any employee who joined the union should be fired? Well, Ms. Tarbell, oh, workers should be loyal to their employer. You know, we, we rely on each other for mutual success. We, we form a community of interest for our, our mutual benefits. Now, I, I will admit that I may not pay the highest wages, but the benefits are good. Benefits? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, benefits. I mean, after all, they get a free pass on the train. <laughs> but no, those union devils, they're not satisfied. No, no, they want eight-hour workdays, pensions, better working conditions, and I am out of time now, so I have to be off. Good day, Miss Farrow. Thank you, sir. Oh, one more question. How does Mrs. Hill like the new house? Was it built with union labor? <laughs> Well, as you can imagine, Father never did really make peace with the unions. But now about that Northern Securities case, that's what we're here to talk about in the first place. You see, it all started back in 1894. One fourth of the rail mileage in the country went bankrupt and fell into receivership. J.P. Morgan! <laughs> oh. I thought I might see you here at the club. <laughs> oh, so tell me, tell me, Jim, uh, what's the news from the Middle West? Oh, I've got to tell you, it is a law of survival of the fittest in this railroad business. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. Well, uh, are you uh, keeping your uh, railroad fit? You do have the fittest railroad in the country. Well, I tell you, though, I've determined that it's time for us to take the bull by the horns and get control of that Northern Pacific Railroad. It has long been a scourge to my great northern railroad. Well, their <coughs> reckless competition is a sure way to lose money. Oh, yeah, yes. It's time to get rid of these ridiculous, wasteful rate wars. It's time that we form the two lines into a community of interest. Oh, but Jim, what about the Sherman Act passed in 1890? <laughs> Do you think the government will allow a merger? It has been 10 years, and uh, the courts don't seem inclined to literal interpretation. <laughs> literal? Literal. <laughs> Well, <laughs> so you're not overly concerned about the regulators. Ah, government regulators are a bunch of doctrinaires, you know, you know, you know politicians seeking office and tech head college professors and, oh, and preachers. No, no, no. So what do you say, JP? Is it, uh, could we discuss a possible uh, arrangement? Hmm. Well, why don't we talk about it over dinner on the Corsair? Oh! What is the annual cost of upkeep on a yacht? <laughs> well, if you have to ask, <laughs> you can't afford it. <laughs> well, then I won't ask. <laughs> well, with J.P. Morgan's help, Father finally gained control of the Northern Pacific Railway. It took a few years to arrange a deal, even involved several trips to England to have meetings with the Deutsche Bank representatives to cement what they called the London Memorandum. 
mother went along on some of those trips and she had a wonderful time. She kept a diary and made daily entries without fail. June 30, 1900, Saturday, London. A cloudy, mm, smoky morning. <laughs> Land sakes, this black fog is terrible. Rather cool for the season. We have only seen four automobiles here thus far. This morning we saw a series of 10 pictures painted for Madame Dubery on exhibition. It said the works now belong to Mr. Pierpont Morgan. Afterwards, we went to the Royal Academy and saw many portraits there. Some interesting. <laughs> we walked to the hotel through Hyde Park. It looked gay, with people about in costumes better suited to the drawing room than to the street. We are to dine with the Marshall Fields this evening. Mrs. Field tells me that Mr. Field has a bright young man named Harry Selfridge working for him in Chicago who is planning a splendid new shopping emporium. It will be stocked with everything one could ever need. Imagine one-stop shopping. We are indeed living in modern times. We are indeed. After many more secret trips to London to complete the deal, Father gained control of the two great transcontinental railways operating in what he called a fruitful cooperation. Then he gained control of the Burlington Railroad with routes from here to Chicago, the gateway to the East Coast. With the addition of the Burlington Line, Father's railroad empire was finally complete. But his empire was threatened by another transcontinental railroad, the Union Pacific, which ran from Texas up to California, all the way up the coast of Oregon. It was controlled by Edward H. Heron. There he is. <laughs> he may look like a mild-mannered person, but <laughs> let me tell you, this man caused us a world of trouble. You see, Harriman also wanted that through line to Chicago. He figured if he could get a controlling interest in the Northern Pacific, he could gain control of the Chicago route for his own railroad. While Father was away on a business trip to Seattle, Harriman quietly staged a corporate raid, began buying up Northern Pacific shares on the open market. Money was no object to him since he had the backing of William Rockefeller and his nearly bottomless millions. Yes, everyone remembers John D. Rockefeller, but his younger brother William co-founded Standard Oil and was a savvy businessman. With the Rockefeller fortune behind him, Harriman and his broker, Jacob Schiff, were able to buy a majority of Northern Pacific's preferred stock. Harriman thought he had won, but what he didn't realize at the time was that control of the company rested with the common shares rather than the preferred, and luckily for father, Harriman had not yet purchased a majority of the common shares. Once he realized his error, however, Harriman ordered Schiff to buy 40,000 more shares. But there was a delay because Schiff, who was a religious man, was in the synagogue that day and he could not immediately execute the order. Well, meanwhile, Father heard about it out in Seattle, immediately boarded a special eastbound train from Seattle, and the race was on to control the company. He contacted J.P. Morgan, who was in Europe on one of his art buying jaunts. Morgan immediately ordered his men to buy everything they could get their hands on at any price. Well, the consequence was panic and bedlam on Wall Street. Many brokers had gone short on Northern Pacific stock, and there was none to be had at any price. In the pandemonium, great fortunes were won and lost. The newspapers were outraged. They called it the a naked exercise of raw financial power by Wall Street giants. It wasn't long before all the parties realized they had to call an end to this 
before they brought the temple down on their own heads. Well, when the smoke cleared, the Hill Group had $42 million worth of Northern Pacific stock. The Harriman Group had only $37 million worth, and only $1 million was held by outsiders. Mr. Hill. Oh, Miss Tarbell, you know, I really enjoyed your series on Napoleon in uh, McClure's magazine. Thank you, sir. Do you have a moment to talk about the uh, Northern Pacific Panic? Oh, is that what they're calling it now? Well, did you win the fight with Harriman? Oh, I was never engaged in a fight. <laughs> there were just a few people throwing stones in my yard. Well, that fight nearly brought down Wall Street. Progressives are calling it another glaring example of the need to regulate Unrestrained capitalism. No, well, I don't know anything about that. I'm too busy buying locomotives to pay any attention. But, Mr. Hill, the newspapers report that you very nearly lost control of your railroads. Well, I wouldn't know anything about that. Don't read newspapers, hardly ever look at them. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I've also found that uh, a great many things are inspired in newspapers that you have to take with a uh, great deal of salt. Good day, Miss Tarbell. <laughs> Well, in reality, Father was badly shaken by this entire episode. He said it was the foulest and most unnecessary fight he had ever known. Having very nearly lost control of the Northern Pacific, he set out to pr pr protect his properties from further wolves at the door. He went about creating a holding company to unify management and combine shares in order to make the capitalization so high that it would be nearly impossible for raiders like Harriman to attempt a coup. So Father and his associates formed the Great Northern, or the, excuse me, the Northern Securities Company with enormous capitalization of $400 million. <laughs> well, just three months later, U.S. Attorney General Philander Knox initiated a federal suit to break up the Northern Securities Company as a violation of the Sherman Act. He was obviously operating under orders from the new young president, Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, who never even would have been president if it hadn't been for the shocking assassination of President William McKinley. On September 14, 1901, this nation was cast under a great shadow when President McKinley, the most widely loved man in all of America, was struck down by a criminal more dangerous and desperate than any other, an anarchist. I have a message for anarchists. Anarchists will be stamped out. The wrath of the American people is slow to but once it is kindled, it burns like an all-consuming flame. Our nation is composed of bold men, men who have led in the phenomenal industrial development of our country, men who have amassed great fortunes and formed great corporations, most of which benefit the community as a whole. But with that has come so much good, has also come some that is evil. <laughs> this evil is not the outgrowth of pestilence or decadence, but of prosperity. We should fail in our duties if we do not seek to remedy these corporate evils. No man is above the law, and we do not ask a man's permission when we require him to obey. Obedience to the law is demanded, not asked as a favor. Here, 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 here. There are some among us who assume that if a corporation is large enough, that it can do no wrong. We do not seek the abolishment of corporations. Rather, we recognize them as being important economic instruments. Our only desire is to see corporations, and especially combinations of corporations, be regulated and controlled so far as may be necessary to serve the public good. I ask your attention to the prudent jurist and fearless public servant, the man who now holds the position of the Attorney General, Mr. Philander Knox. 
great financiers of this country are certain that regulation will plunge us into the greatest panic that we have ever seen. They, are, they decry regulation as incitement to anarchy. Well, I say bully, Mr. Knox, bully. The enforcement of these policies that have now become law are the antidote to anarchy. And the newspapers ate it up. <laughs> There's a political cartoon here. We, we got that? Yep. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Just look at that. I mean, the newspapers love this. Father and the other so-called evil industrialists paid little attention to TR's blustering. However, it wasn't long before Attorney General Knox announced that in his opinion, the Northern Securities Company uh, control of the railroads was a combination in restraint of trade, a monopoly in violation of the Sherman Act. Furthermore, because it was a railroad trust, it involved interstate commerce, which the Constitution clearly made subject to federal regulation. The New York Tribune called the announcement a sudden and severe shock. Oh, that was putting it mildly. Father was furious. Mr. Hill, a moment, please. I can give you exactly 30 seconds, Miss Tarbell. Yes, sir. Our readers want to know what you think of President Roosevelt's new trust-busting initiative. TR is obviously honest. He really desires to serve our country, <laughs> but he is so vain and self-willed as to have no judgment. His only motivation for bringing the Northern Security suit is to increase his chances of renomination in the Middle West, and you can quote me on that. Attorney General Knox seems to think he has a strong case under the Sherman legislation. Ah, legislation. You can legislate until the barn door falls off its hinges with rust, and you will not succeed. But with control of transportation in the hands of so few men, isn't government regulation necessary to prevent restraint of trade? You now, government regulations like Horse flies, they can sting their host into anguish. <laughs> well, as I said, TR cartoons were all the rage. And there's another good one. Over the next year, the Northern Securities trial testimony was taken in several sessions. Here in St. Paul, in Minneapolis, in New York, the case then was argued before a special panel of four circuit court judges over 16 days down in St. Louis. By the time they were done, there were more than 7,000 volumes of testimony. if any, were taken by you and Mr. Morgan with regards to the arrangements for the Northern Securities Company? Well, there, the large shareholders of the railroads had been considering forming something like the Northern Securities Company for many years. And what was the object of the organization? Well, many of the large shareholders were rather old men, and, and they'd worked together in harmony for many years, and they simply wished to perpetuate a mechanism by which that harmony could continue and success could continue. But what was your purpose, Mr. Hill, in organizing the Northern Securities Company? That was the purpose. The, the placement of the stock in the Northern Securities Company would make no difference. It can make no difference. It will make no difference. But it would, of course, benefit both railways. It would benefit the country. Well, Mr. Hill, let us just assume for the moment 
that may primarily benefit the public. You and the shareholders would get some incidental benefit, would you not? Well, of course, it would benefit both roads. And vice versa, of course. But, but the country will always benefit by a railroad. You know, it, it might be, it, it may be that... Well, Mr. Hill, let us make some attempt to understand each other here. I am not asking you what steps might have been taken or what was possibly done. Would this arrangement not benefit the shareholders? There might be some incidental benefit to the shareholders. Now, Mr. Hill, what is your understanding with respect to your Northern Pacific? Well, will you stop confounding me with the, with the Northern Pacific? I mean, the railroad is just a mercurial indication of the state of the country. If the country is poor, then, then the railroad will be poor. But we always give the lowest rates. And when you keep asking me about the Northern Pacific, I know very little about the Northern Pacific. Stop confounding me with that. We would get a lot further if people stopped counting, confounding me about people with whom I have very little to do. Your witness, Mr. Young. <clears throat> Mr. Hill, I'm sure that the government joins me in thanking you for taking so many days out of your very busy schedule to provide such thorough and complete responses to the government's question. <laughs> I will be brief. Now, based upon your years of experience in the transportation business, Mr. Hill, well, the years of experience, no, Mr. Mr. Young, you have to understand, I have more than four decades of experience in the transportation industry. I stand corrected. Your record and your business acumen are the stuff of legends. Based upon your experience, could you please provide us in practical terms with a description of competition in the railroad industry? Well, of course, see, we do not only compete with lines of transportation, we, we, compete with, we compete with markets, we compete with goods. I mean, it extends all the way down the line. Now, take, for instance, uh, goods that have to travel in the great industrial state of Ohio or, or, or say, Pittsburgh. Those goods have to travel down to the seaboard. Now, we do not wish those rail cars to return empty. No, those rail cars are like a thief. So we make every effort to find a way to bring those cars back loaded with freight. Thereby, we make lower rates for everyone. And what was the purpose in the formation of the Northern Securities Company? Well, we were primarily concerned about the attempt of another raid on the stock, and we were advised that placement of the shares in an investment company would be safer. In the formation of the Northern Securities Company, Mr. Hill, did you have any intent or purpose whatsoever, or did anyone else have any intent or purpose to restrain or restrict trade or commerce among the states? Oh, none whatsoever. That idea never even occurred to us. No, 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 no. No, it was our idea that we would be actually increasing commerce. You, you see, but by, by, by having the lower rates, we would we would benefit everyone along our line. Every merchant, farmer, and tradesman, and every city, village, and township would be benefited benefited by lower carrier rates. Thank you very much, Mr. Hill. I have no further questions. Very well. Counsel, you may each now present your closing arguments and summaries. Your Honors, the final statement of the United States government will be brief and to the point. The oral testimony and the documentary evidence creates a crystal clear picture of a violation of the Sherman Act. It must be remembered that railways are public corporations organized for a public purpose, and they are granted valuable franchises and privileges by the government, including, Your Honors, the right to take the private property of citizens without their consent in vitium. Therefore, railways owe a duty to the public of a higher nature than they have any duty to render unto their shareholders large dividends. The railway business affects almost every aspect of the, all classes of citizens of our country. Therefore, Your Honors, I submit the following proposition. Public policy requires a public duty 
from the railroads of a higher nature. And it forbids any combination that restricts competition. And it prohibits these corporations from combining to thwart such competition. Now, it is well established in the law that any activity that restrains free competition, then the intent can be presumed and it need not be formally proven. The fact that rates and prices did not increase is not important. As stated by Lord Acton in his recently published letter to Bishop Creighton, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. It matters not that the individual who accumulated the power did so with good intentions. Once power is accumulated, that power will corrupt someone. <laughs> this court is too practical to ignore the known and common nature of human action. The officers of the Great Northern are chosen by the officers of the Northern Securities Company. They have no motive to compete with the officers of the Northern Pacific, who are chosen by the officers of the Northern Securities Company. The prosperity of the Great Northern is the prosperity of the Northern Pacific and vice versa. They have a common ownership and they have a common master. To claim that competition exists where competition is useless is an absurdity. If this is not a combination to restrain trade, then there never was one. Your honors, for the good of the nation, the government requests that you enter a ruling that the Northern Securities Company be dissolved. <laughs> Some say that what we are considering is the most important piece of litigation since the granting of the charter by King John. Nay, nay, your honors. What we are considering is the greatest piece of litigation in the history of the civilized judiciary. For just two short years ago that the Union Pacific Railroad, under the control of Edward A. Chairman, <coughs> attempted a raid upon the Northern Pacific, which led to a run on Wall Street with disastrous consequences, which very nearly toppled the economy of the United States of America. The Northern Securities Company was formed to act as a blockade against this type of piracy and thereby to prevent this great nation from again being plunged into an economic disaster equal to or greater than the Panic of 1893, a panic from which we are still attempting to recover nearly a decade later. Now, the uncontested evidence in this case establishes that the Great Northern Railroad still exists. The Northern Pacific Railroad still exists. The Burlington Line still exists. Each has its own unique management, its own unique officers, its own unique employees. Who is the villain in this melodrama? In the government's view, the evil villain is the Northern Securities Company, an innocent corporation whose shareholders merely invest in an industry which they know and understand. There is no evil in experienced businessmen using their knowledge to maximize profits. That is the essence of this great nation. To prohibit such a modest and innocuous investment opportunity would be to violate the United States constitutional guarantee of liberty to enter contracts. The government would take away the right of our citizens to conduct business? 
in the United States of America, the government's contention that the Northern Securities Company might restrain interstate commerce must fail for a simple and fundamental reason. The Northern Securities Company does not operate to stifle competition. Rather, the lodgement of the majority of stock of two railroads into its hands is an aid to commerce, not a restraint upon it. It expands the overall volume of interstate commerce and thereby provides a benefit to the public. Your Honors, the Northern Securities Company humbly requests and justice demands that the government's case be dismissed with prejudice. Thank you. Congress 
as denounced as illegal. The Northern Securities Company affects interstate commerce by giving a few men the power to control all means of transportation owned by two competing and parallel railroads. It matters not, we think, through how many hands the orders come by or through what channels. Therefore, it is hereby ordered, adjudged, and decreed as follows to it that the defendants have heretofore entered into a combination or conspiracy in restraint of trade in commerce among the several states. Also, that the Northern Securities Company, its officers, agents, servants, and employees be and hereby are enjoined from acquiring or attempting to acquire any further stock and are enjoined from voting the aforesaid stock that they may already have. And that they are likewise enjoined and respectively restrained from paying any dividends. Lastly, it is hereby further ordered that the United States may recover from the defendants its costs herein expended. This court is adjourned. Mr. Hills, <coughs> can you tell me your opinion on Judge Sanborn's ruling? Well, Miss Tarville, um, we are disappointed to say the least. <laughs> and the worst part is, Judge Sanborn ordered us to pay the cost of them suing us. Now, I've known Judge Sanborn for years. We've always made it a habit every year, as a matter of fact, to send him a hamper of fresh salmon from our Canadian fishing lodge. And he won't be getting any this year, I assume. What effect will the ruling have on how you run your business? <clears throat> well, we will be printing two uh, different stock certificates. They'll be in different colors. That'll be the main difference. Will you plan to appeal? We will appeal this all the way to the United Well, it took another year, but finally, in a close five to four decision, the United States Supreme Court ordered the Northern Securities Company to be dissolved under the provisions of the Sherman Antitrust Act as an illegal combination in restraint of trade, even though no damage had been shown. There was no room for compromise, but the great Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. filed a brilliant dissent in which he observed that great cases like hard cases make bad law. The Northern Securities case ushered in an era of trust busting for President Roosevelt. Needless to say, it was a blow to father. He, he hated to lose. But in the end, you know, nothing really changed. Father and his partners still owned the majority of stock in the Great Northern and the Northern Pacific. They just had to operate them as separate companies. In 1907, I became president and father stayed on as chairman of the board. He said it was time for him to get on with his long cherished plan to get rid of the burdens of business and enjoy the rest of his life with nothing on his mind but his hair. <laughs> you know, in the end, I think Father got the last laugh. The year before he died in 1916, he built a splendid new office building at Fifth and Jackson in downtown St. Paul. The offices of the two railroad companies were housed in the same building, but of course, completely separated. <laughs> the Great Northern was on one side, the Northern Pacific was on the other side. Overseeing all, however, was Father's office in the middle. <laughs> and the only way to get from the Northern Pacific side to the Great Northern side was through the office of James J. Bell. <laughs> Thank you.